Investors like Carl Icahn and Bill Ackman have made so-called activist investing famous, the practice of accumulating enough shares in a company to where you have genuine influence over exactly how that business is managed and allocates its capital. And when we think of some of the greatest investors in the world, particularly Warren Buffett, we really have this image seared into our brains of Warren kind of just sitting there reading, and for pretty good reason, he's basically told us that his typical day is just sitting in the office and reading for like eight hours straight. But back in the 1950s, Warren Buffett was himself an activist investor. And in this video, I want to share some of the activism that he successfully uh, went and achieved with a little known company called Sanborn Map. Now recently here on the channel I did a three part series on some of Charlie Munger's greatest hits, some of his best investments ever and it seemed like you guys really liked that mini series here on the channel so this is actually going to be episode one in a three part series again this time looking at some of the best investments of none other than Warren Buffett. Now the Sanborn map story begins in November of 1958 and at this time Warren Buffett was managing about a million dollars in capital, much less than the hundreds of billions that he's managing today, uh, across seven different partnerships. So later in the Buffett partnership days before Berkshire Hathaway, uh, Warren Buffett ended up consolidating a lot of these little partnerships into just one entity but at the time he was managing about a million dollars in capital across seven different partnerships. By 1958, the stock market in the US had spent about a decade trucking pretty much straight upwards, and it had been growing and going up much faster than the underlying earnings in a lot of US public companies. And you can see that here from a growing PE ratios in the S&P 500. It was no longer a time where Warren Buffett could just flip through Moody's manuals and find great businesses trading at a PE of two or something. It was starting to get to a point where he had to work much harder and actually get out of the office and do some groundwork and be really active in companies in order to continue generating high returns for his partners. Enter Sanborn Map. Now Sanborn Map was a little company uh, headquartered in New York which basically made these very, very detailed maps for for many cities across the US. These maps detailed things like power mains, water mains, uh, engineering details, and details on emergency staircases for a lot of different buildings. And Sanborn basically sold these maps to a number of different insurance companies. And Sanborn was a reasonable but actually steadily declining business by 1958. Basically there had been a lot of consolidation in the insurance industry and Sanborn pretty much just had less insurance companies to sell to. Now the reason that Warren Buffett got interested was because Sanborn Map was trading at about $45 a share. They had this uh, little map business but importantly they also had a stock and bond portfolio uh, and that alone was actually worth $65 per share, a $20 per share premium to what you could uh, buy the shares for in the open market. So in pretty typical Warren Buffett fashion, he bet very large on this particular situation. He put more than a third of the million dollars of partnership assets into Sanborn Map. And additional to that, he bought more for himself and his wife Susie personally. He also had his mother, his father, all his sisters and his aunt Alice by his Sanborn map and he also shared the idea with many of his sort of colleagues and friends in the investment business that came from the Ben Graham school of thought and we know of at least four other investors that um, also piled into Sanborn map one of which was uh, the late Walter Schloss. And for the privilege of sharing that investment idea with some of his friends in the investment business, uh, Warren Buffett actually also took what's called an override, which is basically uh, agreeing to get a percentage of the profits in order for one, sharing the Sanborn Map investment idea, and uh, two, for a lot of the work that he was about to put in, in terms of being active uh, in the company, in order to create shareholder value. So he was sort of leveraging his capital by being uh, very heavily invested in the first place, but then also capturing a portion of the profits from his friend's investments in Sanborn Map. So Buffett was now in a position where uh, he, his family and his friends uh, had enough influence to allow Buffett to get a seat on the board. Buffett flew out to New York on about a 10 day trip um, covering a kind of a few different things. He was meeting with prospective investors but on one of those days he had his first board meeting as part of the Sanborn Map company board. 
When he turned up to his first board meeting, he was kind of appalled to see that uh, the board meeting was really more of an old boys club than an actual board that was kind of there to, you know, compound shareholder value and so on. Uh, many of the board members were actually representatives of insurance companies that Sanborn uh, sold to. Basically, the customers were on the board. And uh, like I say, it was more of an old boys club than really an active like corporate board. And it was actually at the point where uh, many of the board board members literally got out cigars and started smoking cigars and Buffett was kind of sitting there thinking you know it's my money that is paying for those cigars and he started to get really frustrated with that experience. There was also next to no insider ownership on the board of the nine uh, board members who represented insurance companies. Uh, they combined owned 46 shares in the company of the 105,000 shares that were outstanding. Now Buffett's idea here was actually pretty simple. He basically put a proposal to the board to split out the map business from the investment portfolio in order to make it a lot clearer for investors where kind of the value sat and he thought that would be um, you know a move that would create a lot of value in the market. But when Buffett put that idea to the board, he got a lot of pushback. Now, we have to remember that this is 1958, and a lot of the board members at the time uh, were kind of fresh off the experience of the Great Depression and World War II, and they had this sort of mindset of basically hoarding cash for a rainy day in order to you know, be able to get through any lumpiness that the business might experience. Now, Buffett left that first board meeting very frustrated, and what he did is he basically went back out to the open market and just kept accumulating shares. This was at a period of time where he was building up a really successful investment track record so he had a lot of new cash inflows from new investors joining the partnership he also had uh, his dad Howard who was a stockbroker actually recommend Sanborn map shares to some of his clients and all of this kind of helped Buffett to effectively get more and more and more control of the shares over time. Buffett was now at the point where he had effective control of the business between you know himself and all his family and friends and his father's clients and so on so uh, he went back for kind of round two he went back and held another board meeting put the same proposal forward again and again even at the second board meeting with all the extra ownership that Warren Buffett had in the company again he could not get this proposal across the line with the board and just to annoy Warren Buffett a little bit more yet again the board got out the box of cigars and uh, started smoking away some of Warren Buffett's capital right in front of him by uh, you know puffing cigar smoke around the room. Now three days after that second board meeting an extremely annoyed Warren Buffett uh, contacted the other board members yet again and basically threatened to hold a special meeting uh, in which he would try to take uh, total control of the company if they didn't uh, kind of capitulate and didn't go through with his proposed plan. So finally in early Early 1960, more than a year after Warren Buffett put that initial third of his fund into Sanborn Map, the board finally made an offer to shareholders and it was actually quite an interesting uh, way that the deal was structured here. Essentially shareholders of Sanborn Map could exchange their shares in order for a chunk of the investment portfolio. Of course uh, the shares were trading at a steep discount to uh, what the portfolio alone was worth. There was also the Sanborn Map business itself but by going through this exchange uh, shareholders could trade their shares that were uh, you know, trading in the market for about 45 dollars uh, to get an investment portfolio that was worth $65 which they could then of course immediately sell and kind of uh, capture the, the spread between those two numbers. About 72% of the shares held in Sanborn Map actually went through with that transaction and it really worked out quite well for all shareholders even if they didn't take that deal. Of course the people that swapped their shares for stock ended up uh, you know, capturing the spread between the uh, market price and the value of the investment portfolio. But the shareholders who didn't take that deal uh, ended up with the remaining Sanborn Map business. And the remaining business was still left with sufficient reserves to run the operations and weather a storm. And it also had significantly less shares outstanding since this deal had gone through, which meant that even though the business was on a steady decline, the earnings per share and the dividends paid per share actually grew quite substantially. And in the process, there was actually quite the capital gain built into that investment portfolio that Sanborn Map 
uh, had been kind of sitting on for a long time. And it actually eliminated about a million dollars worth of potential capital gains tax liability, uh, which was pretty significant for a little company like Sanborn at the time. So that was a story of uh, one of Warren Buffett's little known adventures into the world of activist investing from way back in 1958. And if you want to kind of learn and read more about all the intricate details of this activist campaign and of the uh, actual transaction and deal that ended up happening for shareholders, uh, I can really recommend two resources. Uh, one is the Snowball by Alice Schroeder. The story uh, is detailed uh, quite extensively in one of the chapters of that book. And uh, secondly, check out the 1960 Buffett Partnership Letter if you want to hear Warren Buffett describe it himself. He talks through, again, some of the details of what happened in 1960, uh, which was a year when his partnership was actually up a little over 22% due in large part to some of the successes that he ended up having at Sanborn. Now I really hope you enjoyed that story here of Warren Buffett and Sanborn Map uh, back in the 1950s. Uh, again, like the Charlie Munger series that I did on the channel not too long ago, I want to share some of Warren Buffett's best investments ever and I'd really like to share um, kind of three quite different types of investment. In this one we've looked at uh, an activist type investment. Uh, later down the track we will look at a wholly owned subsidiary that now sits in Birch Hathaway and then we will look at one of just the great uh, great business investments that Warren Buffett is really well known for. So if you want to see the next couple videos in the series, be sure to like and also subscribe to the channel if you are new here. But that's it from me for this one, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.